In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about Leptospira. This genus of spirochetes is both host-associated, colonizing the renal tubules, and also transmits via the water, particularly water contaminated with urine. The genus Leptospira is found within the family Leptospiraceae, and it's related to the Spirochetales, which includes Treponema and Borrelia, as well as the Brachyspirales at the class level. So it's sort of a distant cousin of the organisms we talked about in our last lecture. Leptospira are biocontainment level two, and they're unique in that these organisms have two chromosomes. Culturing Leptospira is certainly possible, but is extremely challenging. It can take weeks to grow and really requires specialized skills in order to work with it. These organisms cause a constellation of disease syndromes in many species. Um, we find them in multiple hosts, they have environmental reservoirs, they make their way into the water, and so the epidemiology can be quite complex. This is a scanning electron micrograph of Leptospira and pterogans. I think you can appreciate these are spiral shaped or corkscrew shaped organisms. And here we can see the characteristic crooked ends of this genus. These images here are of some formal and fixed heat treated Leptospira. Um, and what I've done is blown up the image on the right hand side here and enhanced the color a little bit. These are really, really thin bacteria and they don't tend to stain very well. And so they can be difficult to visualize without either specialized staining techniques or visualizing them using something like dark field microscopy. Leptospira are maintained by animal hosts. So they persist in the renal tubules and are shed in the urine where they then go on to contaminate the environment. Infections with Leptospira are oftentimes water associated, and this can be either rivers or ponds, tends to be freshwater. And as a consequence of this, we tend to see outbreaks of infection associated with flooding. Leptospira is very susceptible to desiccation. And so from a control perspective, um, this can be a, a useful tool that we can use uh, to prevent transmission, ensuring a nice, clean, dry environment. In this image here, you can see probably a silver stain um, of a section of the kidney. I think you can appreciate these organisms here localized to the renal tubules, so their primary site of colonization. We find Leptospira in many animal species. So classically, we think of it being in rats or other rodents, and we can certainly get um, cycles of this organism within wild rodent populations. From there, it can spill over into other wildlife species or domestic animals, either directly through contact with infected rat urine, or through contact with water. So the rat pees into a water supply that these animals then drink and become infected themselves. Similarly, human infections with Leptospira can be either as a result of direct contact with infected animals, either rats, some other wildlife species, or domestic animals, or through uh, water which these animals have contaminated. So swimming in contaminated uh, rivers or uh, lakes, for instance. Leptospira is not a nationally reportable disease in Canada, and so we don't have great statistics for exactly how common it is. However, we know that it's relatively uncommon here compared to other parts of the world, and the places, the countries which have the highest incidence tend to be tropical regions. So Seychelles in the Western Indian Ocean, the Caribbean, and South Asian countries, South and Southeast Asian, tend to have the highest rates of Leptospira, at least in people, and we would expect to see sort of a similar uh, trend in animals as well. The taxonomy of Leptospira is quite complicated. Um, we divide Leptospira into both species and serovars. So within the genus Leptospira, we have 68 species, which are defined genetically. So this is based on their DNA sequence. It's a phylogenetic relationship of one species to another. Serovars, on the other hand, are defined based on the presence of surface antigens. So this isn't a genetic relationship. It's based on essentially how the immune system sees these uh, organisms. What are the antigens that are present on the surface? And as a consequence of this, uh, serovar to species is not a one-to-one -one relationship. 
We can have one zero var found in multiple bacterial species. For instance, uh, Leptospira gripotyphosa, so the serovar gripotyphosa, can be found within Leptospira interrogans, the species, or Kirchneri. The opposite is also true. We can have multiple serovars within an individual species. So Leptospira interrogans can include Bativia, gripotyphosa, Harjo, Ictrohemorrhagia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And we don't see these mutually exclusive groups the way that it might be most intuitive to think about them. These organisms invade tissues through moist or softened skin, through mucous membranes, and also by ingestion. They must produce some kind of adhesins because they're able to grab onto our tissues, but as of yet, they haven't been identified. Leptospira also produce what are called surface surviving proteins. Um, their role isn't known, but they're associated with pathogenic strains, so there must be some relationship with how disease is caused. They produce heme oxygenase, which allows them to use heme as an iron source, so that protein within our uh, red blood cells, within our erythrocytes. And then finally, they're motile. They produce flagella. There are a wide variety of presentations that we see with leptospira, even among individual animals. So in cattle, it can vary from subclinical infections, milk drop syndrome, abortion, hemoglobin area, and icterus. Pigs, similarly, they can be subclinical, they can be mastitic, we can see reproductive issues, fever, icterus, or high mortality events. In dogs, acute hemorrhagic disease, acute renal failure, infertility, abortions, and icterus. Icterus is coming up as a theme again and again. Um, in horses, recurrent uveitis, abortion, and icterus. And in people, we can see uh, high fever, muscle aches, vomiting, icterus, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and rash. So we're going to start off by talking about Leptospira serovar harjo in cattle. Um, infections of, of animals with this serovar most often occur without overt clinical signs. We may see reproductive problems, so reproductive failure or abortion. And it's also been associated with milk drop syndrome. So these animals may be mastitic, they might have a flabby udder and have yellow or red tinged milk. We can also see chronic genital infections uh, with Leptospira harjo, so not just of the kidneys, but of the lower urinary tract. And it's shed into the urine, um, possibly for life. So it can be very difficult to clear these host adapted strains. Leptospira pomona in cattle, Cirovar pomona, um, causes much more acute infections, and they're much more apparent. We see fever, anorexia, lethargy, decreased milk production. These animals can have hemolytic anemia with intravascular hemolysis, so red blood cells being broken down within the vasculature, and petechiation. Treatment of leptospira in cattle really depends on which serovar your patient is infected with. So if it is one of those host adapted strains, you may be less likely to clear. And if you were to try and treat these animals, it would rely on antimicrobials as well as supportive care. So potentially IV fluids if they're in renal failure, non-steroidals, um, and potentially even blood transfusions. Vaccines are available. Um, and we can also prevent these infections by maintaining a clean and dry environment. Remember these uh, organisms are spread through water contact, so keeping things dry can be really helpful. We can also eliminate carriers, either treating them or culling them from the herd to prevent them from uh, causing ongoing contamination of the environment. In these images here, you can see some tissues from a cow which aborted. So on the left, we have uh, the placenta and an example of some necrotizing placentitis. And on the right, we have fetal tissues, which have been obviously opened up. And what you can appreciate here is icterus. So I think it's maybe most apparent on the mesenteric fat. Um, instead of being a nice bright white color, the fat is very yellow. So this is a characteristic hallmark sign of icterus. We get yellowing of otherwise white tissues. That's where it's most apparent. This color change results from high levels of bilirubin, which can be as a consequence of multiple disease processes, including intravascular hemolysis. In pigs, Leptospira pomona is a host-adapted serovar. Um, it, again, persists in the kidney and sheds into the urine. 
Clinical disease is most typically seen in gilts, so those young female animals who have had their first litter. Um, and in these animals, we see pyrexia, listlessness. Um, it may, in fact, just go unrecognized in the herd. In chronic inf infections, we can see abortions, and these can be associated with really considerable economic losses. Other serovars of leptospira um, are also recognized in pigs, including ictrohemorrhagiae, canicola, australis, gripotyphosa, and hardjo. Um, the reason it's important to be aware of these different serovars is that each one is adapted to a different host, host species. And so ictrohemorrhagiae, for instance, is associated with rats. And so knowing which strain you're dealing with can help you to implement uh, control measures and biosecurity measures targeting the host species that's most likely to be shedding the organism, causing problems in your herd. In this image here, you can see the kidney from a pig with leptospira. And here, the classical pathological lesion is multifocal interstitial nephritis. So these white spots occurring all over the serosal surface of the kidney. Um, this is colloquially described as milk spot kidney. And while there are a number of possible etiologies responsible for this, leptospira is a very important differential diagnosis. Treatment in pigs um, relies on antimicrobials when dealing with an outbreak, although it's apparently not very effective at eliminating host-adapted serovars. So eliminating leptospira pomona from uh, an asymptomatically or subclinically infected uh, pig can be a challenge. Control measures, management practices are perhaps the most important thing. Um, ensuring that replacement stock are sourced from clean herds, those not uh, infected with leptospira. Biosecurity, um, in previous studies, skunks have been implicated in outbreaks, so preventing contact with these animals, or maybe more importantly, preventing skunk urine from coming into contact with feed or water sources for these pigs. And vaccination.